are standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon for the first time. Your breath is taken away as you notice this amazing vista before you. The sky stretches across the horizon, blanketing the rocky canyon below, where both jagged and smooth features of line and rock and sentiment stand out to you in a wondrous palette of vibrant colors. You are in awe. You linger until evening and witness an Arizona night sky filled with constellations and planets glistening as you hear a choir of coyotes and owls and crickets begin to fill the background. It seems that you are on another planet, in space, standing on an alien terrain, gazing into a galaxy too mysterious for words. You then depart, and you arrive back home. And there's a friend there who is eager to hear about your trip and asks you to describe in detail what you experienced. They ask you to write it all down so that they can read it. And the assumption is, having read it, they will have come to grips in total, completely, what you've experienced in reality. Now let me ask you a question. Whatever you write down, do you believe that this will fully capture your experience? No. 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 We know it won't. Now let me ask you another question. Does that mean the experience wasn't real? No. no. Just because you couldn't put it to words doesn't mean that it wasn't real. This would seem to suggest that there exists a dimension of the human experience that goes beyond human reason. Things that are real, but that are nonetheless um, outside of our grasp to be able to reasonably explain through words. And, and therefore they can't be analyzed in a scientific laboratory. But it's nonetheless real. Now why is this significant? Because our rationalistic and materialistic and scientific and technological world claims that the only things that are real are the things that can only be explained through reason and through words, measured and controlled. But the experience of awe is a direct way of seeing that's not true. It's a direct way of knowing Otherwise, you see, awe is a doorway that leads to another realm. It's no less real than our own, though beyond our ability to grasp it. It goes beyond mental descriptions, and therefore it's trans-rational. It's not anti-rational. It's not against our reason, okay? But it goes beyond our reason. It goes beyond our reason. But it's still real. In other words, in other words, Experiences of awe are evidences that there is a real and greater presence that exists beyond ourselves. It is what has caused people down through the ages and through the centuries to build temples, to worship, to experience transcendence, even to experience the gods. Now, if I were just to stop there and say we should all lay claim to that and believe that, we would be nothing than 17th century romantics. If you don't know what a 17th century romantic is, that's essentially a pre-modern version of a hippie. <laughs> or we'd be 19th century transcendentalists, or spiritists, or, or neo-pagans, or occultists, or maybe followers of New Age spirituality. And I myself have spent a number of years in the neo-pagan movement, so I know what I'm talking about. But there are many people today who see how experiences of awe point to a spirit world, point to beings or a being. But instead of facing God, the creator, as we heard Gail read from Romans, instead of facing the God that is seen in creation in the universe, they turn to themselves and they make uh, themselves or things God. We all have a mechanism, as if I can use that word, inside of us to worship And when we don't worship the Creator God, we worship something else, and we turn that something else into God. Paul, again, let me put the words in front of you so that you can recall what we had read 
uh, for us this morning. This comes from Romans chapter 1, 19 to 23, where the Apostle Paul says, For what can be known about God is plain to them. What can be known about God? It's plain, it's given, it's obvious. Because God has shown it to them. What has he shown them? His invisible attribute, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. How? How do we see God? How do we see his power? How have these things been clearly perceived? You notice what he says? Through, ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been what? The things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. The problem with not seeing God and the obvious fact that God exists is not about ignorance, it's about ignoring. So they became futile, empty in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. You see, here the Apostle Paul says that creation has an inbuilt awe factor. It displays the awesome attributes and power and divinity of the Creator God. And this should lead us to glorify God and thank God. That is to recognize and respond. To recognize and to respond. That is what it means to glorify and to give thanks. We recognize and we respond. But when people remove God as the creator of all that is, they wind up connecting their awe to created things. Like humans and birds and creeping crawlies and animals. I mean, awe is powerful. It humbles us. It tells us that there is a greater reality out there we can't control. And this actually helps us to live better lives. Remember that story I told you last week about the, the little uh, child that desired to become small, the other child that desired to become large? And how the little child who desired to become small was able to see everything in a way that created gratitude and awe and amazement because everything was so much larger and beautiful and, and amazing. Whereas the, the child that wanted to be a giant looked at everything as just a plaything, a toy. And it was a lesson to say, we need to encourage humility rather than pride. We need to be little and small and realize how small we are in light of this grand, great cosmos. We talked about that last week and when we enter into that, we strengthen our faith. Because it teaches us that we're ultimately not in control and that we need to trust, to trust another. And that leads to wisdom. That's why it says in the Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And last week we said that word fear in the Hebrew is yerah. And it actually means the wonder or the awe. It's not simply being scared or afraid or it's... It has to do with awe and wonder. And wisdom is the essential component needed to live a life of skill. It goes beyond information. It goes into the realm of transformation. Wisdom is something that we are all looking for, something that we all need. It's how to live a robust and happy and good life. And so here we learn that the first doorway, the first step into living this kind of wise life is what? The fear of the Lord. The awe of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Notice it's not simply the awe that leads to wisdom, but the awe of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. As Christians, our awe and wonder, especially as it relates to the cosmos, which we'll be talking about for these few minutes we have, as it relates to the cosmos and the created world, it should direct our hearts to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me? The awe that we experience, the awe that we're going to be encouraged to experience in this creation, in this cosmos, should direct our hearts to the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the question is, how can we cultivate this kind of awe in our lives? That other passage of Scripture we had put before us in Isaiah is that familiar throne room scene, right? In Isaiah chapter 6. 
King Uzziah, in the year of King Uzziah's death, Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up. That was an important vision because in the year of King Uzziah's death, there was political turmoil, which would have led to economic turmoil. And so what Isaiah needed to see was a vision of God. It's the same thing for us. In the midst of economic turmoil, in the, in, in the midst of political confusion, we need a vision, a grand vision, a great vision. And Isaiah gets that in the throne room of God. And what does he see? He witnesses. He doesn't do anything. That's important. He doesn't do anything. He witnesses. He looks. He becomes aware of what? Himself? Inner light in himself? How great the rock is, the tree? How awesome human beings are? If they can just be smart, then they'll bring in, bring in, the, bring in the kingdom? Is that what he saw? No, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he saw the angels bearing witness to them, right? Kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzitzavot. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then he hears the whole earth is full of his Glory, the whole earth is filled with his glory. How can we be in awe of this one whose glory not only fills the earth, but we believe fills the cosmos, fills the universe? How can we be in awe of this glory? Let me just spend the next few moments giving you just one practical, a practice to experience, to help. To help press into this deepening of awe so that we can acquire that wisdom. And this deepening of awe as it relates to creation, as it relates to the universe and everything in it. So that we can grow in our faith and our trust in God. Are you ready? Okay, you're still awake? Good. A few more minutes, a couple minutes, okay? Well, maybe a little longer, but okay. Here's one. Here it is. Okay? Here it is. This is one. There's many. Here's one. Let's start with one. Okay? It is to practice Sabbath. Practice Sabbath. Now, that doesn't mean we all need to become seven day Adventists now, okay? That's not what I'm saying. Okay? Or Jewish, even, right? How many of you have driven through a Jewish community on Shabbat, on Sabbath? So, what do you see? You see a lot of families walking to the synagogue, right? Walking to the temple, walking to their place of worship. Right? I'm not saying we need to become Jewish or Seventh day Adventist or something like that. Remember, though, we we'll want to cultivate awe, the awe of the Lord, and all that engages us with God. And I believe this is what Sabbath helps us to do. If we can kind of get our hearts and minds around it and actually build up enough courage to actually try to practice it ourselves. Sabbath doesn't just mean going to church. I'm very thankful, by the way, you are here at church. <laughs> okay? But it means more than going to church, although that's a part of it. Sabbath is about taking an entire day to intentionally rest in God's grace by enjoying His provision, especially through nature. Let me say that again, okay? Sabbath is about taking an entire day. Okay, now you're, okay. Because oh, uh. what happens is, I do that all the time, Pastor. I'm Sabbathing all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in my house by myself. You know, and every now and then I may, you know, think of God, that that's not what Sabbath is. Okay, Sabbath isn't just not doing anything or being, you know, bored or just kind of having a thought about God every now and then. It's taking an entire day and focusing on resting in God Resting in God's grace by enjoying His provision, especially through nature. If you can learn how to Sabbath well, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, it will be the best vacation you've ever taken. Now, you and I are often used to thinking this way when it comes to day and time and work and rest and all of that. This is how we usually think. First, we have to work, right? I got to get up because I got my tasks to do. Not going to get done themselves, Pastor. Huh? I got things to do. And underneath that is usually everything is up to me. 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 That's kind of, that's the machine going on deep down inside. On the surface, we're saying, I got to do, I got to get things done. I got to do something. And then when I'm done, I get to do what? I get to rest. 
And usually rest for us is what? It's usually just turning off our brain and sitting in front of the boob tube, right? And then we turn it off at night after spending four hours with white light flashing in our eyes and we try to lay down and go to sleep and we wonder, why can't I go to sleep? Hmm. <clears throat> Pay attention, by the way. When you're doing the four hour thing at night and you turn the light, you know, turn off the TV and you go to bed and you shut the light off. Pay attention to that that's going on in your head. That's the after effect of someone who's not resting. It's not a restful experience oftentimes, right? The kind of rest that we enter into, we call it entertainment. It's not really rest. It's not recreation. There's a difference. I digress. But this is how we usually think. We think of, we got to work and then we rest. But in the book of Genesis, God reverses that order. God reverses that order. There we learn that first we must rest and learn that life is not up to you. Life is not up to me. Because God has provided everything we need. And then when we enter into that, by enjoying the natural world and all of creation and things in it, and learning that, we can work rightly. This is why, by the way, when Jews think of time, the day always starts with the night, right? Evening and then morning. Why? Because the way they think of time is, time is about resting in God and then working for God. We want to think what? We start first, get the maximum amount of energy, right? Maximum amount, and then we'll rest, right? Adam and Eve's first day of work was a rest day. Adam and Eve created on what day? Here we go, back to Sunday school. What day? One, two, three, four, five, six. The sixth day, right? God created Adam and Eve. When was the Sabbath day? On the what day? The seventh day, right? Think about that, okay? God creates Adam and Eve on the sixth day, and then the seventh day is the Sabbath day. It's the first day humans encountered, which was a day of entering into the enjoyment and sufficiency of what God had already provided and created in the previous six days, which was all called total good. Sufficient. Blessed. Think about it. Before they were off naming the animals and working the ground, raising a family and stewarding and blessing the earth, they rested with God on the Sabbath. Now, that doesn't mean they all took a nap together, right? They didn't go take a nap together and go to sleep, right? Rest doesn't mean sleep. It means entering into the good of what one has accomplished. You all have done that, right? Gentlemen, right? You the... Lawn mower, you're out there probably sweating away, and then you sit down and you're looking at the lawn. Look how beautiful my lawn is. So much beautiful, but so much better than my neighbors. <laughs> Ladies, same thing. A task done, work accomplished, sitting down for a few minutes, putting your feet up, and you're right, entering into the good of what you have completed. That's the essence of rest. It's the enjoyment of a job well done. And a lot of times it doesn't mean just falling asleep or turning off your mind. It means now being able to have a perspective and energy to do good things without worry, without fear. Entering the Sabbath means entering a world of gifts and graces. Gifts and graces, and only in this case, this is where our illustration breaks down, we don't have to do anything. We're not working in order, it's not something that we're doing in order to rest. It's something that God has already done. And God has already freely given by His grace. You see, for observant Jews, practicing Sabbath means a variety of things. One of the things it means is unplugging from technology. There's a huge wisdom there. If you ever go to Israel and Jerusalem, I'm told, I haven't gone yet. But apparently you can't even turn on like the lights. Because Sabbath says don't kindle any fire, right? And the, ele and the electric... You know, sparks supposed to be considered fire, so you, it's very hard to get on an elevator on Shabbat in Israel. You know, they've got these rules: no driving. Again, you've seen as you drive through a Jewish community on, on, on uh, Saturday Shabbat, there's lots of Jewish families that are walking down the roads. Everything is done in the service of slowing down. Slowing down. There's no even business talk, right? No checking emails. 
Even when we're talking, we're trying to be aware of, is my talk about God? Is it about grace and love? So even words are used in, in such a very intentional way. And again, why do Jews do all these things? They do it to slow down and to make room for God. And to cultivate awe. To cultivate awe and wonder. Now, of course, when you start adding hundreds of laws and things in that, you know, at that, at that point it gets pretty cumbersome to try to observe sin. That's one of the things that Jesus critiqued, right, in the Gospels. He critiqued the fact that they were not enjoying Sabbath in a way that caused them to rest in the grace of God because they were doing things out of a sense of, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to get this done. And, and then it just piled up all these rules and regulations to the point where it became a burden. And they neglected the easy yoke which Christ came and offered. That can happen to us, we need to be careful. But we can only experience God's glory, sisters and brothers, when we enter into this kind of perspective. When we slow down and we eliminate the distractions and the clutter and direct our hearts towards God. It's very hard to cultivate awe if you're not willing to slow down and notice the glory in all things. Now, what made this look like for you? What made this look like for us? What, what in principle would it look like? What does Sabbath look like? And it's not just a list of rules or works designed to gain favor with God, right? What are some things that we can do? How about this? How about start off and try to make it a whole day? Put it in your calendar. If you haven't figured this out, by the way, I, I, here's the newsflash, right? If you don't put it in the calendar, it ain't going to happen, Right? That's when you know you're, you're really getting serious. When you get out the iPhone, you start, right? A little calendar, boom, you put it in. And then you put a little alarm on, on your device in your home. It starts going off and reminds you, okay? We can still ignore it, but it becomes a little harder. And then when you hear that little ding go off, isn't it? then you unplug everything. What would your day look like if you were unplugged? Unavailable. I know what some of you are thinking. The day you unplug, that's when the kids are going to call you and tell you their house is on fire. And then when you're explaining to them afterward how the pastor said to practice Sabbath and you were just trying to do that, they'll tell you, but you know what? Now my entire house is burned down and it's all because you could. Right? I'm here to tell you, probably not going to happen. If it does, I'm sorry. but <laughs> Right? We don't want to do this because we think we're going to get in trouble. If I'm not available, something bad is going to happen. We have to let go of that thought. We have to allow ourselves to rest in grace. Okay? Do life-giving things during the Sabbath. The Sabbath doesn't mean just kicking back and it can. You can take a nap. You can relax. But do life-giving things. Do some devotional reading. Maybe this is the time to get that devotional book out and just spend time going through it. Or maybe you just take the day reading a, a, a Bible book. Maybe you read a chapter and then you sit down for 30 minutes and then after that you read another. You can, you can integrate the whole day around the Word of God in doing something like that. You can ask Jesus to open to you his wonders. You can definitely get out in nature. Take that walk. But instead of taking that walk and thinking, I'll keep the old ticker going so I can have yeah. Instead of just doing a walk for health, try integrating your walk in your spiritual walk with Christ. Maybe you do some prayer walking. Or maybe you just always are thinking about how God is there. And allow yourself to praise God for all those normal things you usually pass and take for granted. Right? Get out in nature. Do natural stuff. Be in the garden. Watch the birds. Stargate. Stay up a little later and look up at the sky. Take prayer walks. Stay close to home. Don't go out, out of town. Just stay home. Stay close to home. Enjoy good food. Don't exert yourself. Enjoy your spouse in all the ways that spouses can enjoy one another. That's appropriate too. Don't exert yourself in a way where you're getting worried and fearful and thinking that it's all up to me. Let that go. There's no responsibilities other than enjoying the gifts that God has given Especially as it's given to us in the natural world. You're going to find yourself awakening to the wonders of God all around you. 
So just imagine spending that whole day in that way, with intentional, with, with, with that intentionality, with just yourself or maybe just a few loved ones. Now, if the whole day scares you, I know some of you are thinking, ah, I don't think so. Well, if it scares you, if that sounds too extreme, try a half day. Try a half day. And if a half day scares you, try a few hours. Try a couple hours. Start small, but start. The point is, without placing this in your schedule and just starting, you won't do it. Start somewhere. Many of us do not naturally open ourselves to awe, even when we face something awesome. Have you noticed that? I sometimes am so trapped in my head, I'm thinking, I should be in awe right now. <laughs> but I'm not. It's kind of been dulled. The senses have been dulled. Sabbath kind of cleans out the senses so that we can start sharpening our, our uh, hearts to be in awe. We need to adopt spiritual practices to help us tune our hearts. And Sabbath is such a practice. It's a spiritual discipline. By the way, before I bring this to a close, by the way, when you start practicing Sabbath, guess what? It starts practicing you. It starts seeping into the rest of your day. Even into the rest of your week. Sabbath becomes like a spiritual gong. Remember the gong? Remember the gong show? If somebody come up there and play that, you know, they you know, boom. They would always gong people that I like. I don't know what that says about my taste, but you know. But Sabbath is like a spiritual gong. You strike it on Sunday, and the effects reverberate throughout the week. For instance, the flower you thank God for on Sabbath causes you to start thanking God for flowers that you see everywhere throughout the week. Or maybe the thrill of noticing how content you are when you're relaxed and you're just enjoying God's gifts like the sunshine and the earth and food and sky. And you realize how this keeps you free from feeling the need to be anxious or to buy more stuff throughout the week. And on it goes. As we sharpen our spiritual focus and begin to see awesome things on the Sabbath, we then find ourselves more receptive to awe, to God's greatness in creation, and the Christ-like wisdom that will indeed follow. So I've included some practices in the handouts. I've given you a little handout inside your bulletin. You can take that home, and I encourage you to um, read those insights and questions. And for those that are watching on YouTube, I will try to list those in the description below the video. But let me leave you with the words of wise elder uh, Zomisma in uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamis. When he gives this counsel to the novice monk, uh, Alosha, he says, Love all creation, love all God's creation, both the whole of it and every grain of sand. Love every leaf, every ray of God's light. Love animals, love plants, love each thing. If you love each thing, you will perceive the mystery of God with all things. Once you have perceived it, you will begin tirelessly to perceive more and more of it each day. And you will come at last to love the whole world with an entire universal love. And join, even, the heavenly choir of angels proclaiming, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Amen. Amen. God, help us to witness that and to let it change us and that we would bring that change into the world. We thank you, our creator, in Christ's name.